Okay, welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and start. I'm, I'm reading a lot from a script just because I'm wanting to honor what the organizers of the event had asked for. And so if I look like I'm not quite looking at the camera, it's because I'm attending to what I was given. Um, but welcome, we're glad to have so many folks here and I imagine we'll have more folks joining in as we go, which is great. Um, and we wanted to give a welcome on behalf of ME Action Georgia, who coordinated this event. Um, and we're grateful to you all for participating in this event that's part of the 2023 Millions Missing Campaign. I'm Karen Gimnig. I'm connected to this group largely as a good friend of Jess's and was asked to facilitate this meeting. So um, in, a, in a healthy ally kind of role of being able to um, be present here without illness issues. So I'm delighted to be here with all of you and please let me know what you need from me. If I'm not doing what you need, please let me know that. And um, I'll just mostly be moderate, moderating the discussion. Note that we are recording. So if you don't wish to be recorded, this would be a time to turn off camera and or sound. Um, welcome to have it on or off, whatever works best for you. So we are delighted today to have with us journalist and author Ryan Pryor, along with research scientist Elizabeth Weaver. Both are ME patient advocates with li lived experience, and together they collaborated on the groundbreaking new book, The Long Haul, which we are going to talk about today. We'd also like to welcome folks in our audience who are living with ME-CFS and long COVID and their caregivers. And a special welcome to healthy allies who may be here who are important in the fight against this illness. So glad to have everybody here. Our format today um, is focused on hearing from Ryan and Elizabeth, and I will introduce them, tell a little bit about how the event came to be, and then ask some questions from our event organizers. Um, I will take comments and questions from the audience as we have time for them, and I will do my best also to be monitoring the chat if you want to put those in. Um, you're welcome to put questions or comments in the chat at any time, and then as we have time, I'll call for opportunities to raise your hand, um, which you can do with your camera on, and I'll try and see you, or you can do the electronic hand, whatever works best for you at those times. Um, so whatever works best for you, we will try to be responsive to however we get the message. So that's the overall format, and just to give a little bit of introduction, Ryan Pryor is a journalist in residence at the think tank, the, Cen the Century Foundation, and writes the Patient Revolution column for Psychology Today. His long history of ME-CFS advocacy includes directing Forgotten Plague, a feature-length documentary about his own journey as an ME-CFS patient. And now Ryan has written the book, The Long Haul, Solving the Puzzle of the Pandemic's Long Haulers and How They Are Ch Changing Healthcare Forever. Ryan, did we get you? That sounds great. Yeah. OK. And we also have Elizabeth Weaver. Liz is the Associate Director for Georgia State University's Brains and Behavior Area of Focus, where she works and advocates at the intersection of neuroscience and society. Liz was also the researcher and co-writer for The Long Haul. And she currently sits on the NIH National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke MECS CFS Research Roadmap, MECFS Working Group of Council as a Patient Advocate and Lived Experience ex Expert. So Liz, welcome. And I'll ask you the same question. Did I get you? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Very welcome. All right. So we're really glad you're here for this discussion. Uh, I want to say just a bit about how this event came to be. A few years ago, Josie Justice one of our ME Action Georgia advocates created a book club geared at those with ME and long COVID. This year, the group read The Long Haul, and they discussed each chapter. The book club members thought so highly of this book that they decided to invite Ryan and Liz to continue the discussion for this year's Millions Missing campaign. So I will be starting with a few questions from um, ME Action Georgia book club, which they've asked me to speak because they knew that they may well today not have the energy to be speaking. And so I'm reading out to you the questions that they came up with um, and, and using those as the basis for the event. Um, 
Any questions about process or where we are? Just so glad everybody's here. Okay. So with that, um, Ryan and Liz, I'm going to let you start talking. <laughs> and the first question is, just can you tell us a little bit about the book and include why you were involved in creating it and and how it how that came to be? So, um, yeah, the, the the origin story starts in a few different places, and um, the the earliest version of this is in is in 2007, uh, which is um, my own um, uh, MCFS story of you know similar to a lot of people getting getting sick and uh, seeing a lot of doctors and and uh, not getting a lot of um, understanding. Um, I'm I'm in the category where I uh, have mostly fully recovered, um, so a lot of where I'm um, centering my journalistic efforts is um, when I can is writing stories um, to, to further the cause. And um, so I had a um, you know, backstory of um, writing about uh, this disease in 2012 for um, USA Today, and then that leading into doing a documentary film called Forgotten Play that came out in, in 2015. Um, and wrote a number of stories for about MECFS um, for CNN. Uh, and it was there from 2015 to 2021. And that coincided with becoming a health and science, um, health science and features writer during the pandemic. And so as, as I was um, covering the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it was really obvious to um, most of us who've been in the uh, chronic illness community for a while that this was going to be a some we didn't quite use the word long COVID or long haulers or or mass disabling event, but um, this intuited that there's something really um, severe and complex and uh, befuddling was going to be on the horizon. So I um, uh, was campaigning with, with with my hair on fire to my editors at CNN to to write as many pieces about uh, long COVID, which which is what it can be known as um, throughout 2020, um, and. I thought we, a lot of my goal with being a, a writer for CNN was always to to write as many articles as I could in order to um, eventually get a book deal to write about about something. I thought maybe there might be a memoir related to my own chronic illness journey. So there, um, when I, I I met a, a book agent in um, 2020 um, uh, around October of that year, um, and um, much more so than writing anything about my own personal story, I was dramatically more interested in writing the global story of of this new, seem, seemingly new disease that was really like you know, a spin on um, an existing set of diseases. Um, so I wanted to um, uh, we we put together a book proposal um, of, of uh, I think at the time it was twelve chapters. Ultimately, what what came out was was sixteen chapters, and. Um, uh, we we shot the, the proposal to publishers and um, we were able to get a deal. And um, earlier in 2015 or so, Liz and I first met um, after she had watched Forgotten Plague. Um, and so she had told me when we first met that she was a neuroscientist working for Georgia State and that she had a business on the side where she did um scientific research for non nonfiction books. And this was back in like 20, I found a note to myself in that I wrote in like 2017 or, or 16. And it said, reach out to Liz about book. This was four or five years prior to actually there even being a pandemic or there even being a, a book deal. But I had always in, in my mind thought that if I did write a book, um, I would want to collaborate with Liz. Um, but that's, that's, some of the origin story, but I want you know, let Liz can jump in and kind of explain how she got involved. Great. Oh yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, so I first heard about Ryan when I was uh, getting diagnosed back in 2016, and I watched his movie, and I was just like, you know, really taken aback that there was an entire movie about this disease that was so unknown, even in the circles that I run in, which, you know, a lot of people study neurological disease, and I had never even heard of this. Um, when I spoke to my friends that were medical doctors, no one could, you know, understood it or or had heard of it. So, you know, I was just really shocked that there was an entire movie about it. And I reached out to Ryan because, you know, I also was surprised to see that he was in Atlanta. And so all those things kind of just, and, you know, who actually put me, um, Timber, um, is who put me in 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 touch with Brian. and uh, and so it was kind of serendipitous. and um, 
we met at Fire Pit Pizza, and this was, uh, you know, before I'm I'm pretty much mostly ha- homebound at this point. I'm not recovered, um, but this was when I was still going out pre-pandemic, and we met at Fire Pit Pizza, and uh, and just immediately clicked both professionally and personally. And so we've, you know, been friends ever since and are working on now a couple grants uh, at the intersection of neuroscience and um, policy and neurological disease and putting patients first, these kind of like democratic uh, pursuits in science. And, um, but yeah, with the book, he, he reached out and, um, and, and it was just, it was a, it was a perfect fit. Um, for both of us, um, from our expertise, both as lived patients, you know, our experience as lived patients, but also um, professionally, what we had both been doing for the last decade or so with our with our lives. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how we came together. And and like I said, you know, I mean, the support of this group is is why Ryan and I know each other and why this book came together, right? So that's like, you know, a really big deal that this group is is still pushing forward and doing the work they're doing because it it does forge uh, friendships and relationships um, even if we're doing it from our beds um, it's 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 pretty incredible what we're all what we're all getting done as a group. Yeah, I appreciate you noting that. It's amazing what connection can do. It's lovely. Um, so this next question is for Ryan. Um, you spoke in chapter seven about how sick you became after contracting COVID and how long you took to recover, even knowing all the right things to do based on your experience previously with ME. Um, do you consider this experience as an ME setback or as long COVID? Like, how do you identify that? And in what ways was recovering from COVID different from your experience with battling ME when you were younger? Yeah, it's, um, and I think my my dad is on the call, and I think my mom maybe too, but um, yeah, so I think a lot of big part of this is that, you know, we're dealing with this as a family and not just dealing with it um, as an individual. And I, so that, um, in that respect, it was the same because I had a lot of support from parents to um, help help prepare food, help me to take, you know, scheduling doctor's appointments, all of that. Um, to, and I just want to make sure, I, you know, First and foremost, I think illness is a is a social phenomenon that um, you know we are living it in context of our surroundings. Um, so in that respect, it was definitely very similar. Um, this, from a symptom perspective, um, it was I would say it was like ninety percent similar to like any other um, ME type setback. That I, I was very sick, um, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. And then um, was gradually recovering throughout that period. But I always, every couple of years, I had um, a major setback of, of six six weeks or eight weeks usually. And um, a lot of times those setbacks took place in January, um, which once I went back to like, mm-hmm. think about why did I have really bad crashes in January, 2016, January, 2017, et cetera, probably because I got some kind of seasonal virus um, during, during that period. So when I got a um, seasonal virus in 2020, it was a, a really bad one, which it, but it was also um, re-experiencing a lot of the same um, yeah, symptom relapses that I, I was accustomed to. But having 10 years of experience under my belt, um, managing the, these flares, not just by myself, but with family and with, and with a doctor who was um, local and extremely, um, adapted, um, you know, none of this stuff was surprised for any of us. So, um, was able to get back to my former self more quickly. Um, also because of, of being able to, um, uh, go on short-term disability from CNN. That was my third time going on short-term disability for over the course of six and a half years of working there. I think I, ha- I had to do short, short-term disability three times, um, and usually for about a, a month or so, each time, but um, understanding how to deal with the bureaucracy, understanding how to deal with your family, understanding how to how to um, uh, actually manage the symptoms, um, all of that, you know, that that lived experience goes into um, uh, uh, rebounding. And, and it sounds like for you, COVID was a similar rebound to other seasonal virus type uh, rebounds. The symptoms are are a little bit different. For me, they're like it's slightly different, I would say, but um, but uh, neurological manifestations and fatigue and this you know post exertional symptom of 
um, you know, really small exertions um, being tremendously overwhelming and, and you know, needing to be in bed and, and sleeping for dramatically longer than I, I normally would. Um, a lot of those were, were all um, exactly like within the norm. Ooh, ooh. St uh, standard deviations, yeah. In, right. Insofar as deviation is the norm, yeah. Right, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so in the preface, you provide a quotation that talks about how we learned to recognize what was formerly imperceptible. For many on our audience today, that lack of recognition is familiar as they have to reintroduce their disease every time they seek medical care. What challenges do you see as the MECFS community tries to redefine long COVID as a disease with historic precedent and as a new face on an old disease? And, and that, either of that, you feel free to chime in on this one. That quote at the beginning, um, it, it came from an email that Hillary Johnson sent me. So Hillary Johnson wrote a um, famous book called Osler's Web that came out in the 1990s. And I was, as I was getting ready to, to write this book, um, she sent me um, some emails to, and um, a lot of advice and uh, that quote was in there. And I thought that was just tremendously perceptive because um, she had spent 10 years of her life writing about this disease, uh, writing about MECFS, um, which, and I was, I was about to say writing about this disease, which long COVID is basically the same thing as MECFS. So, um, and I think in, in any generate, rather than, that quote comes from the 19th century, but um, and I'm writing in the 21st century. Um, Hillary is writing in, in, in the very end of the 20th century, but um, the same concept, uh, of course, uh, manifests again and again and again throughout medical history. Um, and the, it, this that quote comes from a, a French neurologist, but the um, who, was, who was a pioneer, a real pioneer in in the, the field of neurology in the first place. But um, I think what what's different now um, is there's in 21st century there's so much social media technology, so much, so many new ways of doing medical diagnostics. Um, and most importantly, in 2020, there was a global pandemic of a, of a severe respiratory virus. So all of those things um, are, you know, a confluence of factors that leads to uh, being able to perceive um, a set of characteristics about a large cohort of, of people with, with severe post-viral uh, illness that uh, had definitely been um, imperceptible but um yeah liz do you want to jump in and on your oh um yeah i mean i think it's like you were saying like it's a timeless quote because century after century we've had the same thing we've seen the same thing happen to so many populations and it's such a stubborn learning curve we're seeing with like the medical community to not um accept what's happening here and and this might have been the perfect confluence of things to happen where we may be getting some movement uh, understanding um, that these things, you know, have been the same thing we've seen in the past and that they are real and they should be documented. And like Ryan said, that patients are organizing themselves through social media and they're empowering themselves to, um, to talk and, uh, you know, make change and advocate for themselves on a, even on a congressional level. So I think a lot of that has changed with this pandemic. What's particularly interesting in the, in the, in this case and what, what, what this the book uh, tell, talks about in, in chapter three was the, the the emergence of this support group on slack body politic that um was was fully influenced by um the me community and there's a, a person named allison sobrana who was a important uh, member of the body politics slack group who did not ever get has never gotten COVID even three years later she um uh was very adamant about joining this COVID support group um, in the first couple of months of the pandemic because she um, intuited correctly that um, a large number of people were going to get these conditions, which which include MECFS uh, and POTS and uh, mast cell activation syndrome, uh, among a lot, a lot, a lot of other things, which is mostly in this category of, of dysautonomia. And she um, conveyed the collective wisdom of, you know, I think thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of researchers and, and patients and funneled it directly into this body politic group so that um, everything they are in terms of what they're, the, um, their ability to, to uh, be on point about uh, explaining chronic illness to people come, you know, probably came from Alison Sobrana and that um, their ability to um, 
help you know, about 15,000 support group members and then ultimately to um, explain the uh, long COVID to the media um, in every inter every major international news outlet was was asking for um, patients to interview and they're all most of those patients came from the body politics support group and most of those patients were therefore being uh, informed about their disease from uh, Allison Soprana and so the um that was I think tremendously exciting and interesting about the way that peer-to-peer -peer health groups um spread information 10 times faster than this much slower process which is doing research, um, getting it validated, and then getting it in the medical textbooks, usually like 15 years after the fact. And um, so patient support groups can innovate uh, at a, in an exponential rate, 10 times faster than um, what the medical establishment is, is doing. That's exciting um, to see the progress. Yeah, go ahead, Liz. I was just going to say that like another thing that's been really helpful with like the spread of social media and these patient groups has been like a change in vernacular. So like that there is a vocabulary that people can, um, they can understand and relate to. So the word POTS, I hear people say that much more uh, now than I did before. And so these words like POTS and post-exertion malaise, the more we say them, the more we tweet them, the more we hashtag them, the less we're gonna have to reintroduce ourselves to every single family member and medical person um, because the vocabulary is changing. Um, and so having a lexicon that patients are actively talking about, it infiltrates not just um, you know the psyche of our patient advocacy groups, but it also infiltrates the society in general. And so that lexicon is uh, I think really important. Yeah, it and, makes and powerful, yeah makes a lot of sense that having a shared language and a known language would add to the communication just amazingly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I think this is probably a good moment to take questions from the audience if you have them. And if there aren't, then I, I have more from the book club. We will not run out. But um, this might be a time to just have some interaction with questions or comments. Um, and feel free to put things in the chat if you would like. And I'll try to to track those and read them out. And I see Michelle has figured out how to use the electronic, electronic hand. Do you want to speak your question? Uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, first, the book is really fantastic. Um, my question for you guys, since you've sort of been on the block for a long time now, and I haven't, uh, my ME progressed in 2021 non-COVID. I'm still uh, COVID free, um, but it seems like just in the short period of time that I've been plugged in that there is some, some serious momentum going on right now. The research uh, roadmap group, whatever it's called, um, knowing that Liz is a part of it and so many others that are way wise and way needed in the NIH, um, and all these different things that are happening right now. I'm wondering from your perspective, does it feel different or is this newbie easily impressed? When in, when I started doing this in 2012, I remember there being a, a you know, scuttlebutt, like, oh, you know, this time it's different um, mm -hmm. compared to something that had happened in the 1990s. But um, I think, yeah, I definitely think it's absolutely different now that the, um, it's dramatic. I mean, not to say that it's like at the, this is the turning point because it's it's it'll be a lot easier to write this history twenty years from now to look back and say that it what it was in fact a turning point. And in you know, in the this process of writing in the book over um, you know twenty twenty one and and just barely into twenty twenty two, it felt like it was a turning point, um, especially early in the pandemic. It was a lot of lot 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 of force around covid um and then as the vaccines you know came in in 2021 um there's you know obviously a lot of rhetoric around the, are we moving beyond the pandemic and then you know, then there's this feeling that maybe the opportunity is slipping um and then you know we'll talk about this later but the NIH uh, recovery initiative um you know we were chronicling that um with this this huge study um of long covid and it was that was not a, from 
what we could tell um, in 2021 that research initiative looked like it was getting off on the wrong foot, but it was hard to um, to delve into exactly why. But I think the, the I just I think I felt like the vibe was very off. That was um, the easiest way to explain it. It was not going to be um, very as patient centered as as it ought to be. But um, regardless of whether the government um, has its act together on on this on researching this the um private um initiatives which are some of them are on a shoestring budget um, um and some of them are the result of patient-led collaborations or just collaborations of researchers from really from a global perspective all of whom got interested in the same disease at the same time um there's a there, i think it's absolutely that this this ultimately amounts to a tidal wave of, of new understanding and um, there's some really interesting new research. Um, microclots is one of the most interesting things that's uh, in, in the book and also just um, written about in the news media more broadly that um, could be one of the keys to understanding the, the complexities at the molecular level or cellular level for this disease. So you know, I think there's a lot of um, new ground that's just being broken in the last one or two years. Um, and I, I think that should be enough to, to really put it hopefully put this over the top to making this much more of a, um, a mainstream disease. And I can talk more about that, but um, Liz, jump in and, you know, from a, from your, your perspective as a neuroscientist, do you, th do you think this is, um, or as a patient? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was gonna say that I think that some of the research that's happening right now, especially around like the technology that we have, um, it creates an environment of a lot of low hanging research fruit. And what I mean by that is that graduate students can walk into this new disease and pick something and study it for their degree, right? So like if I were a graduate student, you know, it's hard to find new stuff to study. It's hard to um, give like you know, make some like grand discovery these days in science because most everything has been done. So you usually add just a little bit to the scientific stuff. But with this kind of disease where we're seeing things like the brainstem is much larger in people with uh, MECFS and long COVID. Okay, well, we've got seven Tesla MRIs, which are like really high resolution MRIs. And we are able to see things we couldn't see before. And if I were a researcher, I'd say, man, this is going to look really good on data. This is going to look really good when I post this. This is going to look really good on grant applications. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this area where there's not always in certain diseases. It's complicated uh, because we haven't solved it yet. So it's obviously very complicated, but so is every neurological disease. Um, you've got Alzheimer's. Billions of do dollars have been spent in Alzheimer's and we're you know just now scratching the surface. And one of the things that we're seeing is that it's possible it's a post-viral autoimmune situation. Um, and it's possible most neurological things are post-infectious disease of some sort long-term. And the reason we haven't really been able to understand them that way is because of the huge delay. So it may, it may take 30 years for these to present themselves, but it could have, the assault could have been when you were in your thirties or forties, it may not show up until you're in your seventies or eighties. Um, so that's why it's been hard to connect the two, but this idea that infection um, has long-term consequences on the body isn't new because we've seen things like polio, but for some reason, like I said at the beginning of the talk, these things have been stubborn in science when there's not something like a cause and effect that happens really quickly, and it does make it hard for people to study, but I do think that, um, especially with the new technology, like I said, this these MRIs that can see things that we couldn't see before because you'd go in, you'd get an MRI. And I'm sure you guys have a lot of people, a lot of you have been in this situation where you're having neurological problems. Of course you go to, you know, a, a neurologist and he orders an MRI. It's like standard care and nothing shows up. You don't, and, and they've ruled out MS. Um, but, but really that wasn't the whole story. And so with new tech technology, we're going to be seeing a, a bigger picture, a fuller picture, and that's going to allow us to, you know, um, you know, address symptoms, I think. Right. It and it, there's no surprise that the brainstem is uh, involved here um, because of our symptoms. Uh, that does make sense. So, 
Go ahead, Ryan. It, it was, um, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, multiple sclerosis was, was treated um, in a much different way where there's a, a lot more doubt and skepticism towards sufferers. But then with the advent of, of MRI technology in the 1980s, um, it became very clear that there is brain lesions and it starts being a biomarker um, for diagnosing uh, the condition. Um, and so I think it's, with a new generation of, of, of neuroimaging technology coming out in the, in the form of the 70, um, uh, you could probably tell a similar story about, okay, what well, is it's becoming more and more objective because of, of um, the imaging techniques. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Cynthia, you have a question or comment. Thanks for letting me pop in here. I'm from Oregon, but I couldn't resist the chance to see some of my wonderful Georgia activists. Huh? Yeah, I know that you guys would be on here, but I do. And I'm also interested in the topic, Ryan. I haven't, thank you. I haven't had a chance to really read the book because it's challenging for me to read. I've had ME CFS since 2009. And I'm one of those people that like a slightly different course than yours. I'm, I'm someone that was 84 pounds and bedridden. So my improvements are to this you know, from the, the depths of what the disease can do. So, um, which I'm grateful for it still, it, but you know, it's, it, I mean, no sh way, shape or form, form recovered. But my concern as an MECF activist, I was on the calls at the beginning of the pandemic saying this will happen, people will get MECFS. And somehow, as we all know, it also, I'm kind of going from the other angle than you, that it got lost in the long COVID discussion because so many people got sick in so many different ways. But now we know that half, I mean, I think the latest figures I saw were literally from 2.5 million up to like five to 9 million have MECFS, if you kind of look at it that way. So I kind of wanted your thoughts because I used to be a journalist and publicist prior to being ill. And, um, you know, what you thought to, I think we need to cement for everybody's sake, both for those that have MECFS, the narrative back into what's happened you know, that this has been around for a long time, but but um, but now there's just more of us with, you know, and also so and also I think it will be helpful to people with long COVID so they get the treatment they need sooner than later. Because as we all know, with who've had MECFS, what you don't know can make you worse and almost kill you, you know, in terms of this disease. So ignorance is not bliss. So yeah, I just kind of wanted your thoughts on where you saw it was going, because I've been frustrated, but I'm also very optimistic now that there seems to be a coming together on, I've done advocacy calls and there seems to be a turn back to being interested in MECFS again, you know, and the science, there's a lot of science there. I don't think I have to tell you, you know. I think, um, yeah, I would just, to, um, what's been, I think it's been just really impressive throughout this is the, um, being on the board of, of Emmy Action and, yeah, and seeing the um, Adrian Tillman as a, a well the the entire staff Adrian Tillman and and Jamie Salter who um, and Lori Jones who 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 um, have been I think extremely effective throughout this mm -hmm. entire period of, of getting um, press coverage around long COVID whenever there is going to be a story about long COVID always getting Emmy CFS. Um, mentioned in it at the same time and so they've they've just got tremendous working relationships with with reporters from you know mm -hmm. for me with with cnn and, and now with psychology today and then but really with um you know, jamie ducharme from time magazine um ed young from the atlantic um there's people from from rolling stone and um i'll, I'll um forget all the different names but just um no they do stunning work i know that reporters from every outlet to yeah to um and that that yeah I and I think the way that it was just at the level of, of how the support groups work and how the our um, interactions with the news media um, I think it's been very um, impressive and not every scientist is going to get get the be as up to date because uh, many of them are, are pursuing their existing uh, research agendas and then uh -huh. doing it in the context of COVID um, but it, anyone who's willing to um, listen even to a degree i think gets the message fairly quickly that the, the this you know dysautonomia or pods or mecfs is um sort of uniquely tied to the um okay. regardless of whether you you have long covid and you have mecfs you, i think everyone with long covid um who's educated understands to 
that they need to compare their experience to ME patients. Yeah. Thank you. And I quickly for Elizabeth, we have, I think, a stunning opportunity in terms of research. Right now, we have a disease that's being refocused on because of COVID, but we also have, I just, I see faces here. There's people of us that, you know, could be studied who've had it for, for decades now. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you see in research people being interested in, in this place and time where you have people that have had ME for decades and are newly getting it as comparison groups. That was my other thought because I come from my healthcare background too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think one thing I, I mentioned in the book as well is that like the temporal, um, you know, that that time where certain people are getting it and then, you know, being studied and then like, you can't really compare those to people that have had it for 20 years uh, because those two groups are not, uh, it's like apples and oranges um, because a, uh, the disease has been there for a long time in the body. It's changed other things, you know, it's changed metabol metabolism. Um, so I would say that like it, you know, we really have to be careful uh, like comparing people that just get ME-CFS. So I think that, I think the way we structure um, research is going to be really important because up until now, you know, when you were looking at research studies, it was like a group of people that have ME-CFS, they were so different uh, within subjects. Was so There was so much diversity within subjects. I think it made it really hard to study uh, these people. But now that we've got people that fit into, you know, distinct groups uh, according to maybe symptomology, but definitely time that you've had it, maybe even the infection that caused it. So, so that's one thing with long COVID is we know what caused it, you know, for, for a certain group of people, we know what the trigger was. Um, that's one thing we can control in research, right? And so we should be looking at um, those groups uh, separately because we can control, the more we can control, especially in humans, the better the research outcome is going to be because humans are, there's so much variety among, you know, like lifestyle, uh, genetics, uh, it just, it, humans make it really hard when we study mice, like if we had an animal model for ME-CFS, that would really also be a game changer um, because you can breed mice that have certain genetics and you can knock out other genetics and you can really control more and there's less variability and there's less um, confounding variables. And so with humans, I think it's just, it's been really difficult to study complex neurological disease because we can't uh, control these variables. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Oh, um, let me just, I'll add here that, so that, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric here that this, this is the, the largest ever natural experiment, um, just by, by virtue of there being a pandemic in the first place. And so that, um, that, that makes it to Liz's point easier to study, um, the post-viral effects, um, more so than ever before. And, and the, the bet, to date, prior to um, the pandemic, the best research that was being done to to control for the um, this post infectious nature of MECFS was being done by um, Dr. Avendra Nath at NIH, who did the, um, you guys may be familiar, but he he um, designed the intramural study uh, through NINS there, and they would bring patients in for for two weeks, um, and in order to qualify to even be in the study, the person that had to have had MECFS for less than five years, and they had mm -hmm. a, a known viral or infectious trigger, so that they called it PI uh, MECFS, post-infectious MECFS, and they, so they designed that study very intentionally, and then they literally did like uh, every test known to man, and that was starting in in 2017. 2017. Um, and now we're, we're six years out from when they first began that 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 deep dive study into uh, 20 or so patients. But that um, they've just finally submitted that to a, uh, a a journal, which I think is the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and it's so it's it's in peer review now. And then they've got another seventy or so papers that will come out from that study, which is the most intensive, most well designed, and deepest um, study ever to date on on ME. And um, so, regardless of where where the insights come because of of renewed interest from covid uh long covid um that this incredible study which has been five years in making and, and actually too slow because it, it got very delayed for a couple of years because of, of the pandemic 
Um, and because of a lot of the nature of, of peer review and then getting it into a prestigious journal, which is a little bit problematic because it's like it would be better to get it into a less prestigious journal and get the information out as fast as possible. But it'll it'll it say, say what you will, it will get into um, a very, very major journal. Um, and it is the best ever set of studies. And there's dozens of papers in the pipeline. Um, and I think that'll be very significant development. And that'll happen probably this year. Good news. I want to turn to another question from the book group. Um, in the book, you highlight the actions of people with ME-CFS and long COVID and how that they can, the actions that they can take to survive and change the broken, a broken system. What would you say to people who are too sick to do that work or for whom trying to do that work might make them sicker? Um. I mean, I would say definitely don't do anything that's going to make you sicker. <laughs> um, and I would, uh, you know, for myself, since I am a patient, I, I uh, and, and someone that also advocates and sometimes I'm too sick to advocate or work on work on this. Um, I would say it's, it's really about turning inward and realizing what's what's best for you in every moment and having to keep checking in for yourself if in that moment doing something that if, if in that moment what you need is to feel empowered or to feel you know then then follow that avenue but if in that moment what you need is rest then try to put your blinders on and and only worry about yourself um, and take care of yourself first always put yourself first yeah, I think you know we we struggled with this as as we you know toss ideas and and uh, debated uh, what what to put in the book and and whatnot to the this idea that um, uh, how to conceive of the notion of hope, um, and I derive a lot of hope from just the idea democratic ideals that a set of regular people can um, get up and change the world and. Um, sort of as like a, a citizen, but also as a storyteller um, in believing in this hero's journey, um, that doesn't necessarily apply um, to every every patient. But it's like um, how to make your voice heard in a democracy um, and how to um, be the hero of your own story. Um, it Changing a broken system and getting a bill passed in, in the Senate might not be the way to do that, but like developing your own core of, of, of your soul and carving out a life um, is is another way to do that and so there's a, a couple you know I'll, I'll, I'll highlight two two concepts uh, related to hope one of them you know we talk about this in the book the, the stockdale paradox of understanding um, being fully aware of the reality of how severe your situation is and um, not being naive um, while at the same time holding out hope that you have this North star that like um, that your dreams um, might still be possible or an adjustment on those same dreams um, might be possible. And then the other thing I always quote from this, this uh, poet, Charles Bukowski, who has this poem, the, the laughing heart. He says that um, you know, th there is a light somewhere. It, it may not be much light, but it beats the darkness. So I, I have this image of this this um, darkened beach at night, um, and the, uh, one single person holding a, a little candle. Uh, but that little candle lights up this entire great expanse along this beach, and can be seen for miles. You know, well, not not miles, but a lighthouse um, in that same context can be seen for for many miles. And so I think that that you know, thinking of hope as that um, that small little candle uh, amid a great vast darkness uh is effective um and that might be a way that, to think about um you know regardless of whether you can change the world you can at least um you know change your own heart um, beautiful i want to add one other thing that's been important for me and i think someone wrote an essay on it recently about um and it's in contrast to a little bit of what ryan says but i think it again it, it matters like what works for each of us and that is that, um, so I'm, I'm a Buddhist and, um, you know, and I, I, I went to this place, uh, after having significant, um, suffering or experiencing suffering with this disease. 
And one thing I found was that um, when I let go of hope, um, I found a lot of freedom. When I let go of the set ideas of like what I was going to be or what might happen. And, you know, my whole life I had been told, and I think we're all told that like, there's this idea that we have to hang on and strive and, uh, and always, you know, wish that we're going to get better. And for me, I'm just speaking for me, there was freedom and letting go of that um, and letting go and just accepting, like radically accepting where I was in this moment. And, um, and so for me, that was really helpful. And another Buddhist philosophy that I find really helpful is um, this idea of manifesting. So sometimes when I'm really sick, I imagine that, um, so like the, the question of Buddhism is, am I the same flower? Um, so if, if a flower is blooming and you see the bloom and then the bloom falls off um, and then it blooms the next year, like, is that the same flower? Um, and so am I the same flower when I'm able to manifest and be this person? And then when I shut down and I'm not able to manifest and I come back, am I the same thing? And it's like, I still have these roots. I'm just unable to manifest sometimes. I'm unable to show up in the world in a way that, you know, um, other people can, um, but I am still the same flower, um, even though sometimes I don't look the same. Sometimes I don't bloom. Um, but for me, those two things of, uh, manifesting and understanding myself, um, in this world, uh, and, and letting go and just accepting where I am, even though it looked like surrender to some people, um, I was not giving up, um, but I was giving in and I, I, I different differentiate those two things. Wonderful. Thank you. As follow up to all of that, and you guys have been talking a good bit about this, but I'm just going to ask the explicit question anyway. Um, having published this book that details the problems with our current system, what plans do you have to try to influence a change in the next year or two? And what do you see as, what hope do you, do you see for the future? Um, so for me, um, I. Um, you know, left work for working for CNN um, in, in late 2021 um, and then needed a couple more months to finish um, writing the book and um, then had a couple months of um, of edits and then got got in touch with um, happened to get in touch with a, a think tank called the Century Foundation which is where I work now in um, uh, the Century Foundation leads this Disability Economic Justice Collaborative, which is a, a coalition of about 40 different think tanks or grassroots advocacy organizations, all working on this larger um, issue about disability economic justice. And they understand that the largest number of newly disabled people in the generation are um, COVID long haulers. And my, my role is to, as a, a journalist in residence and uh, leading our narrative work, is to tell the um, the human story at the heart of this this great um, mass disabling event, um, and to you know putting it in the I always use principles or that I learned from uh, St Stanford Medicine Acts, which about around patient centered design, or or human centered design, and if we if we empathize with and center the experiences of, of people with lived experiences, you you end up designing policy solutions um, and and treatment interventions that are dramatically different than what would have happened if, if a, um, a researcher came into it from a, an ivory tower standpoint, uh, who spends all their time in the lab and looking at data and not being around real people. Um, it, there's just vastly different um, outcomes or questions that even get asked in the research context or in a, a policy solutions context. Um, and so I think for me, uh, figuring, you know, cre creating a career tra trajectory where um, I'm sort of draw several different Venn diagrams. One of them is academic and um, scientific. One is policy, political and policy. One, one is journalistic and narrative. And then one's more grassroots and, and activist. Um, when, when you put those four circles together and you, in, the, in this, the overlap in the middle of that, in, in that Venn diagram, I think that's where change occurs. And that's where I, I, I find some of my, my purpose, and I think doing it in the context of, of this think tank as, as a journalist in residence who works for a think tank. And a think tank is like a, um, 
it's like a university without students. It's a it's an academic re, it's a research institution that lives in Washington D.C. So it markets directly to uh, people on Capitol Hill or people in the White House. Um, and so channeling the grassroots experiences um, through story and through think tank into policymakers, I think, is a a way of, of bringing about about change. Um, and then thinking about it in this in this human centered lens um, is uh, a way to to change institutions. So that that's my answer to um, how to to rethink how, how to use this book to to um, think about the next path forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and and Liz will have an equally interesting answer. Answer. I don't know. My answer would be pretty close to his. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, like, you know, uh, what we decided at Georgia State was to go ahead and apply to be uh, a center for neuroscience and society. And um, one of the main goals of that center, we have not gotten that grant yet, but if we do, um, we're going to be you know, very excited. We're, um, and Ryan and I are both on that grant. Um, I'm the director of uh, disability policy and patient led innovation. And what we'll be doing is exactly that, trying to flip the uh, paradigm of researchers deciding what they're going to research for for the people they're researching. As, and as opposed to that, we want to hear from society and from the community how we should be doing research. What should we be doing research around? What research questions should we be asking? And so this is a, um, a way to infuse democracy into neuroscience um, in a way that it hasn't really been done before. We've always, like he said, the ivory tower has been asking questions that were sometimes abstract and sometimes basic biology, which is super helpful. But when you put a patient-centered lens on research and you ask questions that are going to really help patients and move disease forward, you know, the understanding of the disease forward then you are um, centering patients at the research paradigm as opposed to centering ego, uh, money, um, papers, the number of papers coming out. And so a center like this that we applied for would allow us to do that. And um, and yeah, we're, we're really you know crossing our fingers. We wrote a really great application and um, I, I hope to uh, prioritize ME-CFS um, in this center if I, if possible. So I really hope that, you know, hope we get it. And, and Liz and I may be teaching, well, I, don't, I don't know if I even should say maybe teaching a course, but I think it's getting to the point where we'll be teaching yeah. a course in the spring for Georgia State about democratizing science writing. Um, and then the long haul will be one of the um, textbooks. So as, as if you're an instructor of a course, you, you know, professors are always making kids buy their, buy their book to uh, teach out of it. <laughs> and, uh, so we'll be doing the same thing. Wonderful. Yeah. That's all very exciting and hopeful. We are nearing the end of our time. And, and I'll just say my plan is to wrap us up and kind of put a bow on it and have some closing things uh, for the end of the hour and then to leave the room open. So if people want to stay and keep chatting, there is some space for that. But I want to make sure folks who just had an hour feel like we're finished at the hour. Um, but one of the last things I want to do is, I believe, Ryan, you had asked a question of the book club that we want to give them a chance to answer, which was about their takeaways from the book. So um, I think Josie has the sort of some summary answer of that question to give to you, if that's okay. Sounds great. Yeah, um, I think it's remarkable that our takeaways were actually very similar to um, what you just said about um, what comes next. Um, so let me read what we have prepared. We have what we need to solve this, but we are throwing our resources in the wrong places. Long COVID is not new. We have so much good information. We know what to try, what support is needed, what trials to run, what trials not to run. But that wealth of knowledge isn't in the places that you'd expect to look. It's not. It's at the NIH for the most part, it's in the patients with lived experiences and those with ME. So we need to combine that patient experience um, with the energy and passion of healthy allies so they can take that hard earned knowledge and apply it. And we don't need to start at square one. Instead, we need to begin with the experts that have been dealing with this illness for decades. And we need healthy people to learn from us and take action because we are only getting sicker the longer we fight. So it just, really struck us everything that you were saying about the need to center patients um, as we move forward. 
We may have just a minute or two if Brian or Liz, if you want to respond to that in any way. No, I, I, I was just gonna say, yeah. And if others want to want to want to chime in, um, I think a lot of these book, book talks, um, I feel like I I talk a lot, but um, don't always get to listen. So <laughs> to hear others' perspectives. We'd have room for maybe one or two short comments for Ryan and Liz. If anybody else has takeaways or thoughts from the book. I, I think they came to listen to you, Ryan <laughs> and Liz, both of you. Uh, Timber, Timber, Timber. thanks for raising yeah, your hand. I just wanted to thank y'all. One, I just think it's so profoundly different. You know, we read articles and stuff, and there are some excellent ones, obviously, as you noted, like Ed Yong and stuff. But reading y'all's interviews with people with long COVID and reading how you handled the patient experience, um, I just thought it was so profoundly revelatory to see people with lived experience and also professional experience combining that and channeling for us who really, really can't speak anymore. Um, it was really wonderful. We loved it. And we were very passionate in all of our chapter discussions and I wish y'all had been there for every single chapter discussion because it would I mean we just really had a great time feeling seen feeling heard and feeling reflected on a higher level so thank you beautifully said thank you yeah maybe one more if there is one Cynthia, go ahead. Actually, this was more to all of you. I am in Oregon and I am an activist, but you might need Georgia. I have to thank Georgia for all that you do. Um, and, and as well as the authors, you are a stunning group of people. It's I see your work in the world all the time. So I just wanted to say thank you. I was happy to be able to pop on for this. Happy to um, see Ryan and Elizabeth. It, it's, a, it's a treat and some other faces I know. So. Thank you for all of you for doing your good work. You know, it's it's a, it's really a relatively small group of people, and I just really want to thank you. So, thanks, Cynthia. I think there's a lot of gratitude in this room for the group and those that organize and those that come and everything that folks contribute here. And I was going to say thank thank you to Liz Burlingame, who I I wanted to mention earlier, uh, and. And I first met in 2013 uh, when we, uh, Nicole Castillo and I decided to make the documentary and we announced that we were doing a Kickstarter campaign to raise money and, and Liz Berlingame reached out. Um, so that's now 10, almost exactly 10 years ago this month uh, when we decided to make that, um, do that Kickstarter campaign to do the, to the documentary film for Forgotten Plague. Um, and so um, that was before Amy Action Georgia even existed as a group in the first place. But um, Liz has been a, a friend and a partner um, throughout that period, and, you know, a fellow uh, advocate. And so, um, yeah, I'm just say, Liz, thank you for um, yeah, being a great leader here. Um, well, if I can just say, I appreciate that so much. Um, you know, I think the only person who's missing from this is the person who brought Ryan and I together. Her name is Claudia Winlet. She led a chronic fatigue syndrome support group since the 1990s, and her leadership extended over four decades. And we lost Claudia just about two years ago. And this is what we're seeing in our chronic fatigue syndrome community. It's those people who led us through the 1980s and 1990s are dying. And the core uh, leader of Emmy Action Georgia is without dispute Wilhelmina Jenkins. And she's not here today because she's been confined to bed for now going into 17 months. So I think I want to particularly honor those people who brought us up to this point and to thank those of you who helped organize and bring this all together. And just Ryan and Elizabeth, you know, the long haul for me is the book I've been waiting more than 30 years for. So I just thank you so much for just taking the chronic fatigue syndrome narrative that was always ignored and bringing it into the 21st century and, and uh, making people aware of it. It could not be more timely. And we just thank you so much for writing the book and coming and talking to us about it. I hope we can do something like this again. Wonderful. Yeah. 
Liz, thank you so much for saying that about just, um, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, we, Ryan and I are just, like I said, manifesting right now. And one day we're going to pass off the baton and, um, and we'll do our little part and, um, and then it'll be someone else, but the people that have come before us, I mean, truly heroes and without any support at all, you know, they, they trudged through and, um, even y'all that are sitting here today that, you know, you don't have to hold on to hope. You don't have to advocate. You don't have to do anything. Even just witnessing this is, you know, part of, uh, is part of the community. And I, you know, I just really appreciate all of you guys coming today. So I think we're closing up quite nicely, actually, but I'm going to read the things that I've been asked to say at the end here. So first, huge thank you to Ryan and Elizabeth and taking the time to join us today and have so much discussion and sharing your process and your thoughts and and so much about what's going on in the world related to this. That's lovely to have. Um, also want to make sure we thank, as as Liz did, the organizers of today's event so much that they do for Emmy Action um, in Georgia and beyond. And I know of Josie and Liz and Lori and Jess were all involved in putting this together, and there may have been others, but want to particularly thank them for making this happen. Um, wanted to let you know that the recording of this session will be posted on the Emmy Action Georgia Facebook page soon. Please share the video with family and friends and on social media. Get the word out that way. As a reminder, tomorrow at 2 p.m., ME Action has their eighth annual Millions Missing event. They have created an art installation in front of the Washington Monument in D.C. to highlight all the patients who are unable to leave their homes or beds to make their voices heard. The link to the press conference for the event is in the chat. And finally, if you would like to advocate further, or if you are a person with ME seeking support, please join us on our ME Action Georgia Facebook page. We hold monthly advocacy and support meetings to organize our actions and strengthen our community on the first and third Thursday of each month at 1 p.m. Links to these virtual calls are in the chat as well, and we hope you will join us. So thanks everyone for coming. That's the formal wrap up for this and we don't have it. We don't need to close the room so we can stay and continue to chat as people have energy or capacity for that.